So in recent years, the cooking universe has really embraced this trend of you know cooking every single component of every dish from scratch. But I think it's also pretty important to understand when practicality outweighs effort. Yes, it is true that great cooking does sometimes require great patience. But I also think that it's totally okay to go to the grocery store and buy some hot dog buns for your grill out every once in a while, you know? Do you hear my stomach? It is growling f***ed uply loud. So, today we're gonna go over a handful of super popular ingredients and foodstuffs and decide together, me and you, us two, if they're worth making from scratch or not. So there are two ways to make pickles. The first way is canning, right? You're actually gonna be canning, which takes a little bit of know-how and some special equipment. The other way is much simpler and yields a delicious end result. And once you know how to do it, you're probably gonna have pickles in your fridge like all the time. All right, we're gonna make a simple brine here by adding equal parts water and vinegar. I'm using white vinegar. You can use any vinegar you want. These are your pickles. Next up, whole spices. We got coriander seed, mustard seed, caraway seed, and celery seed. Now we need some good old kosher salt. I'm gonna do about two tablespoons-ish. And good old fashioned sugar. So I'm gonna do about a tablespoon and a half. All right, now we're just gonna bring this up to a simmer. We don't need this to come to a raging boil. We just want the sugar and the salt to dissolve and we want this liquid to be hot. All right, here I got some nice cucumber, some dill and garlic. I'm just gonna, I like a nice big pickle like this. I've heard these called, um, it's like half half dills, cause they're like not fully pickled, we're quick pickling. Um, just means they're a little more green and crunchy, not sort of um, dulled down and super briny like regular pickles. Dulled down in color, I mean. Super, super easy. We got ourselves a nice mason jar. I'm gonna take our pickles, I'm gonna put half of them in. Then I'm gonna take some fresh dill. This can be anything, this can be rosemary, this can be thyme. I just think, you know, dill, pickles, dill pickles, you know, very classic, obviously. So we're just gonna shove some of that in there, which is gonna help flavor that brine over time. Couple of garlic cloves, and we can add in the rest of our pickies. You can get them nice and tight in there. Make them friends. We're all family here, these pickles. Oh yeah, oh yeah. All right, I think the last one is for Cherboil. Here's a hack. You don't want to make pickles? Eat a cucumber raw, it's really good. Just put some vinegar on it. Why didn't you think of that? For your health. I'm covering the mic so you don't have to hear this. Can you hear it? These are some crunchy boys. All right, see so these guys all jumping around in there, simmering? That is good. This liquid is hot. No spice left behind, you know? Make sure you're using tempered glass when you're using these jars here. If not, it could crack on you. Hot water in a room temperature or cold jar means explosion. It has happened to me before, so be careful. Now we are going to pop our lid on. Well, it's hot, totally fine. Leave this at room temperature for about an hour, maybe two, just until it comes to room temperature and the pickles aren't super hot. And then you can pop this in your fridge. And I would let these sit for, you know, minimum two to three days before digging into these to kind of let that brine work into the vegetable. The cool part about this is we did it with cucumbers today because that's classic, right? But you can do it with like literally any vegetable. Radishes, onions. Here I have some cabbage. This is just purple cabbage with onions. This is just brine and because of the purple cabbage, you know, it le leaches that beautiful color out. It's a really easy technique and you can do this with any vegetable and once you do, you're just gonna have this amazing acidic condiment or side dish kind of like at whim, whenever you want it. So, at whim, at will, at will. <laughs> oh, wow. Quick pickles, quick and easy. Okay, so are pickles worth making from scratch? I'm gonna say yes with a little asterisk. Yes, sort of. That's because quick pickles are worth making from scratch. They're super easy to make. Once you know the technique, it will unlock many, many mysteries of life for you. But if you're going after that classic sort of deli style kosher dill pickle, it's kind of actually difficult to get that flavor without properly canning, you know, using heat and pressure to make your pickles, which is kind of a pain in the butt, like I said, does take a couple extra pieces of equipment and some know-how. Um, so, you know, for $3, $4, whatever it is, for a jar of classic kosher dill pickles, I mean, to me, that's worth my money. Stock. I'm talking animal bone stock. I'm talking chicken stock, beef stock, pork, pork stock, fish stock, all the stocks. Are they worth making from scratch? Let's find out. Porpoise stock, penguin stock, kangaroo stock, 
furry stock. Okay, so stock might be the poster child of great cooking sometimes requires great patience. It's a bit of a time commitment. You kind of got to babysit it throughout the day. However, there's one, I'm reluctant to use the word, but hack, if you will, that will change your life in terms of, you know, making your own stock and having it on deck all the time. Chances are, if you're a single dude or just, you know, a regular, normal, good old American citizen, you know what one of these things are. The humble rotisserie chicken, or as we call it in this household, a rotis. These are available at pretty much any decent grocery store. People don't realize, but you can actually just, you know, once you're done eating all this delicious meat and plucking it off, use the bones to make good soup. Think about it, it's a roasted chicken. Half the job's already done for you, the roasting part. All you gotta do is pop it in water with some vegetables and wait, speaking of vegetables. If this couldn't get any easier, it just did. This is my trim bag. What does that mean? Well, this is just a bunch of vegetables and herbs and stuff that I kind of had, you know, odds and ends, bits and pieces, parts that I didn't use, right? If you get in the habit of grabbing yourself a freezer bag and just kind of popping all of your leftover trim, your onion skins, your bottoms of your celery, your carrot shreds, leftover herbs that are maybe about to go bad, and pop them in this bag, then put them in the freezer, you pretty much have vegetable aromats at the tips of your fingers at all times. I went ahead and plucked the meat off of another rotisserie chicken, so I didn't have to do it. And these are the leftover bones that we got here. We got some skin as well. Skin has a lot of collagen in it. One tip when doing this though, unless you're going for like a flavored stock, make sure you're not getting like a teriyaki or like a Cajun rubbed rotisserie chicken. Go for the plain Jane stuff here. It's just gonna make your stock more versatile. You wouldn't wanna make like a French sauce with a teriyaki chicken stock, feel me? So from here, it's as easy as popping all this good good and all the blubber. This is the blubber. That stuff at the bottom of the rotisserie chicken, you know, box, that's all flavor. We're keeping that in there. Matter of fact, it's so flavorful that I'm gonna rinse it out to make sure we get every little bit and pour it in. Fantastic. We have some herbs. I got some rosemary, some thyme, a couple of bay leaves, and some black peppercorns. In goes the, the trim. <gasps> Look at that. Reduce, reuse, recycle. And just some garlic cloves. Carrot that I found in my fridge just now. <laughs> All right. All right, at this point, we're just gonna let this simmer for a couple hours. If scum floats to the top, you're just gonna wanna skim that off with a spoon and discard it. And yeah, now we play the waiting game. We got our homemade stock and our store-bought stock. Let's give them a taste and see which one is supreme. I'm going to start with ours. Nice, chicken stock. Pretty no frills, pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good too, honestly. Yeah. So I'm not better than store-bought chicken stock, right? This stuff has been in American kitchens for generations since well before I was born and will continue to be when I'm long gone. This stuff is great, especially nowadays, honestly, like this brand in particular is probably my favorite of them all. One of my favorites. You know, this has real collagen in it, which is one of the reasons why you want to make stock with bones and why stock is so good for that viscous sort of like rich, real taste. It's from the collagen texturally. But one thing about boxed stocks like this is um, one, they're expensive. This, I think this is a quart, so four cups, I believe. Two pounds, 32 ounces, yeah. Yeah, that checks out. The, the flavor's fine. It's a little, this is gonna sound really dumb, but it's a little like boxy, a little synthetic. There's something about it that just tastes kind of fake. Um, in a pinch, again, fantastic. I've made soup with this, it's been delicious. You add enough to it, you can make it taste real nice. However, homemade stuff here is far superior, flavor-wise, texture-wise, money-wise. So this is double the amount of stock that you get in this for doing what we did. I'm here to tell you it's okay to use box stock in a pinch, but if I'm making a really nice dinner, I'm making a nice sauce that I want to really come out and taste good and be memorable, I'm not gonna use a boxed stock. It needs to speak for itself, and this, on its own, you can, you can tell it came from the box. Look at those colors. Very similar. Ours is a little more clear, but otherwise the color is pretty much the exact same, which is pretty cool. Now, like I mentioned, this takes time. This is one of those things in cooking that takes time, but once you get used to saving your vegetables, saving your chicken bones, not even chicken bones, your bones from anything, from a roast, from pork chops, 
fish carcasses, anything like that. And then of course your vegetable scraps, you'll find that it's really easy to make stock, especially you know if it's like a Saturday and you're hanging out at home, you put this in the stove for a couple hours, forget about it, maybe skim it one or two times, but before you know it, you have a load of stock that you can pour into delis, freeze, and then use whenever you want it for like so many different things in the kitchen. Is it worth cooking from scratch? Yes, it is. In a pinch, this stuff works too. Salad dressing or vinaigrette if you wanna be a fancy boy about it. Yes, it's good on salads. Can you also do other things with it? Absolutely. Can you dress your potatoes or other vegetables with it? Sure. Is it worth making from scratch? We'll see. So vinaigrettes consist of a certain formula that if you follow, you can really make any dressing. Let me show you. The first part of the formula is acid. The second part of the formula is fat. Here I got some olive oil and some leftover bacon fat just from breakfast the other day. Save your bacon fat, people. It's good for a lot of things. Next up, we have the emulsifier. I'm gonna use some good old grain mustard and honey, which also acts as a, you guessed it, sweetener. For a little extra flavoring, I'm gonna add a clove of garlic and our seasoning, which is kosher salt and black pepper. This could literally be any spice you want. It doesn't have to be black pepper. It could be like, you know, Cajun, whatever you want. And my secret ingredient here, just a simple little mini smidge of fish sauce for umami. At this point, all you gotta do now is whisk. We're basically forming a really, really kind of like simple, not very stable emulsion here. If your dressing's a little thick, you can go ahead and water it down with some H2O. You can add some more vinegar, a little more lemon juice, whatever. The thing to remember here, the ratio, we talked about it, right? Fat to vinegar. Usually you're gonna go one part vinegar to three parts fat. I like to do two parts vinegar to three parts fat because I like a punchier, more acidic vinaigrette, but you can you know, experiment with it and see what you like the most. Let's give it a taste. That's nice. Heck yeah, that's our vinaigrette. Let's compare. All right, we got our two salad dressings here. We got our homemade bacon vinaigrette and we have our just store-bought good old Italian seasoning, Italian seasoned dressing. This is basically like the Whole Foods version of that wishbone stuff. You know what, you love it. I personally grew up on that stuff. Still the best steak marinade at me. Is it worth making from scratch? My answer is yes, it is. I hate to do this, but we're gonna put a little, we're gonna put a little asterisk right there again. And that's because if you want to get into cooking, if you are a cook, if you consider yourself a cook, then you should have all of these ingredients to make a solid salad dressing already in your kitchen. Now, if you're buying all of these from scratch to make your salad dressing, of course you're gonna spend more money on the olive oil and the vinegar than you know a $4 bottle of dressing. It's quick, it's easy, it's done for you. And there's beauty in that. We're not above homemade salad dressing. However, to make and be able to control the seasoning and the flavor profile of a homemade dressing, put it in a bottle that you know, this is literally from a store-bought salad dressing. I just kept the bottle and now use it for my own dressings. I just have one of these in the fridge sort of at all times on deck. So when I want to make a salad or like I said, dress potatoes or anything else, I can just pull it and use it. It's great. I probably make one at the top of the week almost every week. The flavor is supreme. It's customizable. You can add different oils and customize it to make it your own. So I'm going to say that making your own salad dressing and vinaigrette is a skill that every cook should have and you should make it at home. Now, many of us probably have fond memories of popping open that jar of salsa, pouring it into a bowl after school and you know crushing it with some Tostitos or something, which is amazing in its own right. However, is it worth making from scratch? That's what we're here to find out. All salsas start off with just fresh vegetables, right? So I have some jalapenos, some white onion, a couple of cloves of garlic, some tomatoes, and then this. These are tomatillos. You can find these at a lot of Mexican grocery stores or just well-stocked regular grocery stores here in the States. If you can't find them, just leave them out, that's fine. Then we got some lime and some cilantro. Now, if I wanted to, I could throw this all into a blender, give it a whiz, and that's that, right? It's a fresh, delicious salsa, so long as it's seasoned properly. But if you wanna kind of bump the flavor up a little bit, kind of a low bar to entry to make it way, way, way better, is just throw it under the broiler and give these vegetables some color. So what we're gonna do is just take a little bit of oil. This is just some neutral oil. I think it's uh, canola. Pop that all over, some salt, liberally sprinkle with salt, and like I said, under the broiler just until these things turn nice and charry. Mm. I mean, couldn't be any simpler. We pop these under the broiler for about five, maybe seven minutes, 
got the veggies all nice and blistered and beautiful like that, which is just gonna add a little bit of flavor and roastiness. Literally all we do now is pop it in this guy. All the vegetables going in. We got our what? Got our what? <laughs> was that a real noise? <laughs> Wild. White onion, jalapeno, tomato. Mm. Jesus, I'm really dropping the mater here. Garlic, tomatillo, and all them juices. Heck yeah. We got a little bunch of cilantro. Juice of limon. A lot of acidity, a lot of bright vegetable flavors. There's so much water in these vegetables that we shouldn't have to add any. Plenty of salt. Remember, you need to season your food when it's gonna be served cold, a little more than you would if it was served hot. If you wanted a chunkier salsa, you could pulse all this up. I'm just gonna go for a nice puree. Sound. So you just saw in real time how easy that was, right? All we did was blend up a bunch of vegetables to make a delicious, beautiful puree that is perfect for any decent chip. All right, let's try the store-bought stuff. That looks pretty like deep and rich in color for store-bought salsa, I will say. I taste some smoky chipotle in there. Okay, that's actually really good. It's actually really good. <laughs> All right, let's try ours. Mm. Look at that, you can see all the cilantro in there. Mm. That's really good too, if I don't say so myself. All right, here's the deal. Clearly not all jarred salsas are created equal, right? This is actually really good and did surprise me, you saw it. It's very rich, it's very deep, and it's actually very flavorful, whereas a lot of jarred salsas in my life experience have just been like watery, synthetic, and sad, quite frankly. Whereas this stuff here, we took, I don't know, maybe less than $10 worth of produce, threw it in a blender, and made something really special. So here's what I'll say. Salsa, is it worth making from scratch? Yes. However, if you live near a Mexican market or have access to some of the more newer artisanal jarred salsas and they're under $5, I would say go for the store-bought stuff. Tortillas can be like hit or miss. When they hit, they really hit. When they miss, it's one of the more depressing things in life. Let's see if we should make them from scratch. Tortillas. Of course, we got corn and we got flour, right? Both very different. Now, on this channel, I've kind of made both from scratch before, and I will say, just like making your own bread, it's a little bit of effort, but the end result is so good, it would be like weird for me to tell you that it's not worth making from scratch. However, I'm very, very, very fortunate enough to live in a city with a large Mexican population, a lot of Mexican grocery stores, and a lot of tortillerias which basically are spots that make their own tortillas and then deliver these fresh tortillas to grocery stores that I go and buy them at. Now, this is a super popular brand locally here in Chicago, but I urge you, if you haven't already, to go out to your supermarket and really look for the locally made, sort of more artisanal, store-bought tortillas. Are tortillas worth making from scratch? Yes and no. I know, you hate me for that. But. If you live in a city with a large Mexican population and want to go explore some locally made tortillas, highly recommend doing that. So I would buy them. I, you know, I'm not gonna front. I buy most of my tortillas. Probably 99% of the time I have tortillas in the house. If you live in a small town or out of the country where tortillas aren't widely available, I highly recommend making them from scratch. Get the masa, order it online, go to the store and pick some up. Better yet, do flour. Make sure to use lard. It's very important when making flour tortillas. So yeah. If you have access, buy the good stuff. If you're in a smaller town, tortillas are worth making from scratch. Cold brew coffee, not iced coffee, cold brew coffee. Sometime between 2015 and now, cold brew took the world by storm. Is it worth making from scratch? I don't know, let's find out. It's pretty much second coffee o'clock. Boom, look at that, perfect, wonderful. So, this is what we got here, freshly ground, coffee and this little contraption here which is nothing more than basically just a tea maker right you can make iced tea in this or you can steep coffee grounds with cold water and make cold brew so how i do it is i got myself one of these nice big old xl ball jars right with a little lid here and 
every day, maybe like two days, three days, it takes me to crush one of these things with serious self-control. <laughs> I'll take this, I'll pop it in here, let that drip down a little bit. Then I'll start the process over. So I have one pitcher of cold brew in this contraption sitting on the counter over there for about a day, two days at room temperature while I'm drinking this. When I finish this in about, you know, again, one to three days, I will transfer the, the steeped coffee to here and start the process over again. This little mechanism right here, it's so simple and it's probably, I don't know, like the best 15 to $25 I've spent in a long time. I've had this thing for well over a year and use it all the time. It's never broke on me and it gets the job done fantastically. I'll leave a link below if you wanna check it out. Totally worth the buy. The other thing when you make your own coffee is you can choose what coffee you make. These are fruity, delicious grounds. I get them whole, I grind them myself, and then I just pop them in this bag and go through this in about a week or so. And coffee people, I know I should be grinding this fresh every time I make a new batch, but I'm just not gonna do that. You gotta do what works for you. Reloaded. Boom. And screw that on. Insertion. Give it a nice shake until it turns slightly brown. And then you let this sit on your counter a day, two days, transfer it to the fridge. Boom. Cold brew. And I can confidently say that this cold brew with good coffee is much, much, much better than that Stoke stuff or any other of those plastic bottle brands that you see at like Walmart and Target. If you buy grounds like in bulk and you buy yourself one of these, I think over time you'll find that you'll have better coffee and that you'll actually save money. So, cold brew, is it worth making from scratch? Indeed, it is. Nice. So we just made our cold brew. It only makes sense that we move on to the next thing, which is oat milk. Probably the Taylor Swift of the alternative milks. It's everywhere and it's a little overrated. You don't know her story! <laughs> Is my address anywhere on the internet? <laughs> I should probably take a second look at that. Anyways, is it worth making from scratch, we ask. Let's find out. Okay, so making oat milk can be very straightforward or it can be a little more complicated. When I say straightforward, I mean you blend oats with water, you strain it off, boom, that's oat milk. We're gonna go after the most popular brand of the oat milks, right? Oatly. I know Oatly took some heat for some reason a couple years ago, but we're gonna push that under the rug for now. We're going after an ultra creamy, kind of like almost frothy, viscous palate coating oat milk. And to achieve that, you have to jump through some hoops. The first hoop is you gotta get a pill with amylase in it, which I guess we, we um, it's in our saliva or something, I don't know. It's gonna help break down the oats and remove a lot of that starch so you don't get a super gummy, thick, almost slimy oat milk. Yesterday I went ahead and I did the thing, right? I, I warmed up some of these big whole chunky oats with a couple of these um, capsules. I blended it, I strained it off, and this is what we're left with right here. You can see the oats have really uh, kind of like separated from the water there. All right, so to our blender, we have our oat water. Schwing. Before we add the rest of the stuff, we gotta get this thing moving. First on the docket, we just got some xanthan gum. It's a hydrocolloid, it's gonna help thicken things. Then we got another hydrocolloid, soy lecithin. This is just neutral oil. Almost like we're emulsifying a dressing. Okay, I think it only makes sense to start with the OG. Let's do the oat leaf. Looks nice and milky. Tastes nice and not milky. <laughs> Very creamy. It's a little more like yellow tinged than our homemade stuff, which is actually like super appealingly white. Smells the same. Hmm. It almost tastes more oaty, but like not in a good way. Here's the thing about oat milk. I had to do a lot to get this oat milk to where it is. Most of it off camera, I explained it earlier, but I literally had to buy a digestive enzyme pill, pop it in the oats, do the whole thing, and that digestive enzyme pill has a bunch of other ingredients in it as well, and it almost tastes 
menthol-y, almost minty in a way. Because of all the other stuff in the pill, there's probably some herbs in there. I didn't look at the ingredients in the back, whatever. Because of that, it kind of changed the flavor of the milk. Not to mention the real taste of oats, which definitely is more so in the homemade one here, um, isn't that dope. <laughs> it's just not, I don't, I don't know. Like this, you can taste the oats in it, but it's not like offensive. Whereas this one's like a little in your face. It's a little minty. I have to say the color of the homemade stuff is way, way better. Like that looks like more milk-like to me than that. There's some brown stuff floating around, but it almost looks like vanilla bean or something. The froth levels on this is a lot more than the Oatly, which is surprising. However, again, you kind of have to break through that bubble layer in order to get to the bottom to really enjoy the actual oat milk. And it's a little, it might be good in a latte, but for like a glass of oat milk, which I don't know, I think you might be like a super villain or something if you drink milk straight up in a glass like that. Not as enjoyable. Is oat milk worth making from scratch? I think you already know the answer to that. No, it's it's not. Again, fun project if you want to like experiment and you know maybe like make a good ice cream or something out of this. Otherwise, no, just buy it. This is an oat milk master right here. That's nasty. <laughs> I can't believe that tastes like that. Isn't that weird? Yeah. And it's not. It's the texture's crazy. It's it's like dude, we we literally bl we blended oil into this. We emulsified oil into this oat milk to make it kind of thick like that and. Who knows, these guys might do it too, but they're clearly better at it. All right, bonus round. This isn't something that I would say the average consumer has in their fridge a lot, per se, but I think you should. Creme fridge. Creme fresh. Cream fridge. Cream fridge. Okay, so creme fresh is essentially a French fermented dairy product, right? It's kind of like if sour cream had a cooler, hotter cousin. What? Yeah, we're gonna go with that. Couple of things about creme fraiche. It has a higher fat content than sour cream does, which means it's richer and, in my opinion, more flavorful. Not to mention, because of that higher fat content, it's less likely to split on you. The, you know, emulsion is less likely to break if you were to stir it into a pasta or finish like a shrimp scampi or anything like that. Creme fraiche is um, gonna be your better choice for that. And it's super, super easy to make. And once you make it, it can stay in your fridge for a pretty long time long as you keep it clean. I'm gonna pop in the remainder of this carton that looks to be about maybe a cup and some. This is buttermilk, all right? You can get this at most grocery stores. I'm gonna say like all grocery stores in the US, you know? Probably not the 7-Eleven, but they're gonna have this at your local grocery store. It's a fermented product, which means it's a little tangy, a little sour, and it's what's gonna thicken our cream, right? This is good bacteria that we're popping into our heavy cream. That's literally all you do. You cover this up, you put it on the counter at room temperature for a day. You come back to it a day later, you stir it a little bit, you let it sit for another day. On the second day, it should be much thicker and look something like this. I made this a couple days ago in anticipation for this exact moment. That at one point was just regular old heavy cream that is thickened with that cultured buttermilk. You're making a baked potato, you put a dollop of sour cream on it, sub it for creme fraiche. Like I mentioned already, you're making a shrimp scampi, you want it to be a little creamy, any pasta dish, a little dollop of creme fraiche at the end to finish. On a bagel or a piece of toast with some smoked salmon, there are so many ways to use this. It's a staple ingredient that I pretty much try to keep on deck as much as I can. It's amazing, it's tasty, it's gonna elevate your cooking, and I think you should make it. Is creme fraiche worth buying from the store? No, because it's very expensive and you, they only give you a little tiny amount. Usually it's like seven or eight bucks for a, what, like a cup, a half cup, whatever it is. With this, you can buy yourself some heavy cream, one of these, and you know, save yourself some money, have a nice gourmet ingredient on deck whenever you want it. And then with the remaining buttermilk, if you don't use it by then, brine a chicken with it, make some biscuits, do fun things. You have the power. If you think I missed any ingredients or you have anything you want to say, of course, let us know in the comments below. If you like the video, like the video. Subscribe to the Chansky if you're new to the Chansky. If you're not new to the Chansky, Ramito, you like keys. Easiest, best way to support us is over on the Grocery Fund, AKA the Patreon. If you like the videos, a donation over there is the easiest way to help. It helps pay for groceries, for props, for literally anything that we need to make this channel run. So we really appreciate that. But if you can't support, of course, no worries, my friend. Come on into Discord and give yourself a nice introduction for us. Why do I feel like a theater kid right now? That felt theater kitty to me. I think that's all, guys. Until.